OK, so before I get started, let me ask you a question. How many of your architects here? OK, quite a few. How many of your developers who write code on a day-to-day -day basis? Definitely more than architects. How many of your IT managers who do not write code, who do not architect, but manage a team of professionals? Techies. Great. OK, we have a good mix. So I'm going to have something for each of you. By end of this session, you will walk away with clear understanding of how you can architect for the cloud and how you can enable your applications to be cloud ready. So this session has three different parts. The first part is going to be the introduction of uh, the, the context of the cloud, how you can get ready for architecting for the cloud. And then I'm going to walk you through the guiding principles of architecting for the cloud through the seven principles. And towards the end, we are going to draw conclusions and summarize what we have discussed in this session. So let me get started with the introduction. Let me set the context for the cloud architect. The cloud architect typically needs to deal with, uh, with a variety of things which are slightly different from dealing with the physical infrastructure. So as an architect, you are going to deal with resources that are different. And you also need to understand how scalability is different on the cloud. And because it's not the physical infrastructure that you can touch and feel, you also need to understand various channels to access the cloud. And finally, one very important factor is, as an architect, you're going to influence the cost of your infrastructure on the cloud. So we're going to look at these parameters. So let me start with storage in the physical world. And then we'll take a look at the storage on the cloud. Typically, if you're dealing with storage in the physical world, you will encounter terms like DAS, Direct Attached Storage, SAN, Storage Area Network, and NAS, which is Network Attached Storage. Each of them offer a different way of adding storage to your applications and infrastructure. And many of us are familiar with this. But when you are dealing with the cloud, you will encounter terminologies like the local instance store that comes with EC2, Elastic Block Store, and Simple Storage Service, or S3. They are slightly different. For example, the local instance store is comparable to a direct attached storage in the physical world. You can start an instance and you have immediate access to the local instance store. But typically, that, that is available only within the life cycle of an instance. When you terminate the instance, the local instance store is not accessible anymore. So if you want to go beyond that and you want to use an expandable disk or a drive on the cloud, you can use Elastic Block Store. This is a block storage device that can be attached to any, any instance and can be formatted with the favorite file system of your choice. So think of that as a pluggable, attachable disk in the cloud that's, that is at your disposal. And you can add multiple number of Elastic Block Stores, and you can grow them on the fly. So that's Elastic Block Store. And to make it much more durable and to really have a good backup and retention policy, you can take a point in time snapshots of this storage called Elastic Block Store and store them on Simple Storage Service. Simple Storage Service is one of our highly durable storage services on AWS. And it gives you an ability to, to, to put objects. Whatever you deal with S3 is going to be in the form of objects and buckets. So you can create objects and you can store them on S3 with a very high durability rate. Of course, beyond these, we also have uh, techniques like SimpleDB, which is a massively scale-out, high-performance database, and SQS, which is a simple queuing service, which gives you a mechanism to deliver asynchronous messages on the cloud. And, and all of them offer some kind of storage, but they differ in the way you deal with them and the scenarios for which they are used. Talking about durability, I want to zoom on to S3 a little bit. If you are storing objects on S3, these objects can be anything from a file to an image to, to, to any AVI or even a CSS file. Anything that is static can be easily stored on S3. And S3 is designed for the durability of 11 nines. That's a lot of durability. But if you're wondering what exactly that translates to, what it really means is if you are storing 10,000 objects, on an average, you might lose just one object. You might lose just one object once in every 10 million years. Right? If you are storing 10,000 objects, 
maybe you will lose one object in every 10 million years. That's a lot of durability. This is achieved because of the way S3 is designed and it is highly durable. So you can, you can leverage these capabilities when you are dealing with storage on the cloud. And of course, then comes in scalability. Typically, when we are architecting for the physical world, scalability is thought in terms of number of machines. Typically, you will add more resources if you want to scale up. So scale up and scale out are two different techniques of scaling your application, whether you are dealing with the cloud or dealing with physical infrastructure. And scaling out is typically adding more number of servers to your application, and that is called horizontal scaling. You start with one, but you grow up to n. That will support your demand, and as the application becomes more demanding, you can add more resources to it. That is scaling out. There is also scaling up where you can keep adding resources. For example, you notice that the machine or the server requires more memory. You can add more memory, or it needs more processing, more number of cores. You can keep adding more number of processors, and of course, storage. So that capability is scaling up, which is vertical scaling. This will not really change even when you are dealing with your virtual infrastructure on the cloud. I want to show you a quick demo. We are going to log on to the Amazon Web Services Management Console. And st we are going to access one of the stopped instances and change the instance type. Currently, this is running as M1 large, which comes with a specific configuration. Now we are going to scale it up to what is called as M2 quadruple extra large, which comes with a high memory instance type. We are going to start that instance again. And when it comes back, it's going to be reconfigured for the new configuration. This is how you are going to scale up. There is nothing which is going to really make you stop your application or have downtime and so on. If your, architected is, if your application is architected properly, you can literally automate this whole process and script the same thing that will give you a very good uptime. And, and similarly, when you're accessing the cloud, remember that the underlying aspect of the cloud is, is, is all about API. We have very mature API for every service that we expose. Now, this API is consumed by a variety of layers that you are going to interact with. We have management console that you have seen, software libraries typically meant for developers and architects. We have a variety of software libraries uh, for, for .NET, Java, Python, PHP, and so on. We also support a variety of mobile devices, the popular ones being iOS and Android SDKs. Uh, and we have plugins for Visual Studio, Eclipse. So that makes it extremely easy for the developers to deal with the cloud. For IT administrators, we have uh, command line interfaces and command line tools that can be integrated with the shell scripts. And finally, for the third parties, we have the API consumed uh, in the resource management tools like Puppet and Chef. So these are variety of techniques of accessing the cloud. Most of them can be automated. Most of them can be integrated with your existing environments. So it becomes extremely seamless. And finally, cost. As architects, we never really worry about cost right from the day one of architecture. We assume that the underlying infrastructure is going to be made available to us, and we have a lot of resources at our disposal. And typically, cost is not a factor that we, we spend a lot of time on. But on cloud, many design decisions will start to impact the cost element. It all starts with choosing the right EC2 instance. For example, we have a generic EC2 instance. We have high CPU, high memory, and everything comes with a specific price point. Based on the use case and the workload, you got to choose the right EC2 instance type. And that's going to have a very, very strong influence on the costing structure. Similarly, when you are uh, moving data back and forth, of course, thankfully, the inbound traffic uh, is, is going to be zero. But when you are actually getting the data out, the outbound traffic should be highly optimized by using compression. Similarly, backup and restore strategy, and what kind of tier you're going to choose within S3. For example, we have a high durability tier, which comes with a specific price. And then we have a slightly reduced durable storage in the form of reduced redundant storage, or RRS, that has only four nines of availability mostly meant for reproducible data that you're sure that you can get back, even if it is lost. Uh, and you're going to use that uh, on, the, on the RRS medium. And that comes with a separate pricing. So choosing the appropriate tier will give you an ability to tweak the pricing. 
Similarly, when you're dealing with EC2 instances, you got to be familiar with a term called Elastic Compute Unit, or ECU. Now, this is roughly comparable to a 1.2 gigahertz Intel Xeon processor in terms of computing power. So when you're launching a small instance, it comes with a specific configuration. For example, there is just one ECU, 1.7 GB of memory, 160 GB of storage, and it costs 8.5 cents per an hour, versus a medium instance, which is almost five times in terms of processing. The memory is almost the same, but gives you almost twice the storage, and the cost is almost twice. When do you choose this instance is totally dependent and based on your architecture and your use case and the workload scenarios. So you got to make sure that your EC2 instance types are highly optimized and aligned with your workloads and scenarios. That's absolutely important. So let's see uh, how you're going to choose an appropriate instance type. So now we're going to log on to the management console. Uh, choose an AMI, an Amazon machine image, which is a templatized virtual uh, uh, machine that you're going to launch. And once you have the right AMI selected, you can choose from a variety of instance types, and they differ in the configuration that you choose. And that's going to impact uh, your architecture and also the cost. So to quickly summarize, it's all going to be um, about automation, because you have a new way of accessing the cloud that impacts your scalability and dealing with the virtual resources on the cloud. And it's all about choosing the right models that will impact your cost. So if I am asked to summarize in just one line, what is the best practice of architecting for the cloud? I just got to say this. Launch EC2 instances with EBS behind an ELB with your domain on Route 53, static content on CloudFront, backed up to S3, and your database deployed in a multi-AZ mode on RDS. Just one line. And this is technically the most appropriate way of sharing the cloud architecture best practice. I can just conclude my session with this, but don't worry. I'm not, I'm not here to overwhelm you with a lot of acronyms. I want you to understand some of these technologies better, so it's time for me to get started with the seven principles. The first one is design for failure, and nothing will fail. Uh, I want to take an analogy from the contemporary cars. Most of the cars that we drive today come with airbags, and these airbags are designed to, makes, to make cars crash-proof and collision-proof. Uh, while they cannot really stop the cars from becoming, uh, meeting an accident, what they can do is to make sure that they have the right things in place to protect the valuable lives of the driver and the passenger. So cars come with airbags, and that is an example of how auto automobile industry is thinking of designing for failure. Now, as architects, you got to deal with the same thing, but on the cloud. So here, your design for failure strategy starts with the right backup and restore strategy being in place, and then making sure that your instances are impervious to reboots and relaunches. This happens because on cloud, you cannot control certain aspects. For example, there may be a, a software issue or a hardware issue which will force your instance to reboot and, and get relaunched. If you are maintaining state and if you are treating it like a physical server, you have a lot of problems in bringing it back to the same point where the actual uh, outage or the, or the disruption happened. So, you got to make sure that your instances are completely impervious to reboots and relaunches. They should be able to come back and pick up the thread from where they left and start processing and contribute to the overall uh, scheme of things. So how can that happen? By moving the in-memory sessions to the data, to the data store and, and using a shared nothing architecture by leveraging some of the concepts we have, like using multi-availability multi -availability zones, using Elastic IP, and so on. I want to walk you through the global infrastructure of AWS. Now, this is the globe. This is the map. And then we have six regions. And every region is a set of multiple data centers. Uh, and this is spanning all over the globe. Within the data centers, uh, of course, we also have what we call as Gau Cloud that Dr. Werner mentioned. It's meant for the government agencies and contractors in North America. Uh, and we have. Uh, Availability zones within every region, and an availability zone is a distinct isolated location which is insulated from failures and enjoys low latency connectivity. 
So that's going to make your, your application impervious to failures by, by moving them or giving you a chance to uh, deploy them in multiple availability zones. So this is how the regions are further isolated into multiple availability zones. That's not all. We also have about 20 edge locations that deliver the cached content through an array of edge locations. We have about 20 of them, the recent edition being Sao Paulo in South America. And that takes your static content closer to your customers and end users. Uh, and of course, our Route 53 service also leverages this. So let's take a closer look at one of the regions. Let's take Singapore, for example. And this is going to have two availability zones. And I'm going to deploy my application, the exact replica of the configuration, in two availability zones, which are connected uh, via, via the low latency network. And I manage the synchronization. And in, in case of a uh, failure or an issue with one of the set of instances, I can easily fail over. So this gives me a very good ability to automatically uh, route the traffic to an available configuration. This is highly applicable for databases when deployed within RDS in the multi-AZ mode. The RDS infrastructure gives you a checkbox option that will let you deploy your database in two different availability zones. And the best thing is the infrastructure automatically takes care of keeping them in sync. And this whole process is going to be extremely transparent and seamless. It's a design decision that you're going to take either when you're deploying your database. This is the RDS console. And we are going to choose MySQL when we are launching our database within RDS. Choose the appropriate database engine from a variety of available versions. And choose the class, just like the EC2 instance type. And then finally, make one choice here where you say multi-AZ is, is true by selecting the ES option here. And that's going to give us an opportunity to deploy a database in multiple availability zone mode. The second important point is decouple your architecture, decouple your components in the architecture. So how does that happen? This is possible by leveraging a service that we have called SQS, or Simple Queuing Service, that lets you deliver messages in a highly reliable and scalable manner. So this is an asynchronous messaging infrastructure on the cloud that many customers leverage. This is going to let you send and receive messages in the most reliable and asynchronous form. And the best thing is, this can be used even by applications hosted out of, outside of Amazon Web Services infrastructure. So many enterprise customers use just SQS for sending reliable messages back and forth. So you can use uh, SQS to architect a very scalable and fault-tolerant system. Let's take video encoding as an example. Typically, this has four different stages. The first stage is capturing input. The second is about storing. Uh, the, the content, the third one is encoding, and finally publishing. Now in this mode, everything is in a sequential form. For example, if the encode component fails, the whole process comes down to a grinding halt. You cannot do anything with the application anymore because the critical component of this process has just failed. And this is going to seriously impact your application in a negative way. And that's because you have architected that in a sequential chain uh, uh, kind of an architecture. So how do you make sure that you are taking the same application and architecting it using the SQS and asynchronous mechanism? Simple, don't have a, a hardwired link between each of the components, but instead send and receive messages via SQS queue and messages. Now, you see that there are no dependencies. Every component is autonomous, independent, and can do its own job pretty well. Uh, for some reason, if a component like the encode really fails, your application is still available, and it's, it's going to be a very graceful way of handling failures within the application. Everything will keep working, but just the encoding component is not doing its job, which is still fine. The, the customers and end users can still come and upload their content, and it just gets queued in one of the message queues. Once you go back and fix the encode component, it will pick up the messages and starts processing uh, each of these messages. And the best thing is, you can now scale just the encode component. That gives you an ability to scale just the required component, because there are more number of messages waiting in the queue. And that will overall uh, 
increases the performance of your application and brings it back to normalcy. So this is how you architect for asynchronous mechanism and decoupling your components. The third one is elasticity. This is the best way you can take advantage of the cloud. But before I really uh, talk about elasticity from an architect's perspective, I want to borrow a, a, a short story from the epic Ramayana. During the fierce battle between Ram and Ravan, Ram was, was running, uh, Ravan was running out of his, his army, his artillery and everything, and he had to deploy a very powerful opponent who can tackle uh, the army of Ram. So he sends his son, who is known as Indrajit, also known as Meghnath. Meghnath has a very unique attribute or ability, which actually uh, enables him to replicate himself on the clouds, thus bringing what is called as an illusion of infinity to the opponent. So when the opponent starts using powerful artillery, Meghnath just multiplies and replicates himself among the clouds, and the more powerful the artillery, the faster the replication, and his ultimate goal is to uh, really win over the opponent by confusing him. Now, ultimately, Meghnath uses his power of replication and elasticity on the cloud to take on Lakshman, and also manages to collapse him, and, and then the story goes on. But how is that applicable to the cloud? Well, we need not fight with demons on the cloud, and we don't have gods and demons on the cloud, but what we have are the applications and the traffic to deal with, right? So the same concept of elasticity, rapid replication, multiplication, and the illusion of infinity is what is still applicable to cloud. Here, your application will be launched initially on three instances. And as and when the traffic grows up, and you, you realize that it needs more uh, resources, the environment is going to deploy more number of resources, and your application will automatically take advantage of this. Eventually, when everything gets stabilized, it goes back to the normal configuration of maybe running on just two instances. All this is possible because there is a layer called CloudWatch, which is going to keep a tab and monitor the resources uh, that your application is running on. Whenever it realizes that the application needs more resources, it will work in conjunction with a variety of technologies like elastic load balancing, auto scale, and EC2 to deploy more resources, and, and you're going to automatically scale out and scale in. I want to take specific scenarios on how scaling really works. First, we have the cyclic scaling. Uh, cyclic is very predictable, a time window that you can really identify and very predictable. The example that I want to give you here is Tatkal booking in Indian railways, right? It's extremely predictable. Every day morning from 7.45 till 10 o'clock, anything to do with railway booking is extremely busy because of the Tatkal booking time window. Now, once that window is over, everything is back to normal. So that is cyclic. Every day or every week or every quarter, a specific time window which is identified. The other one is event-based, where you're just getting ready for a mega event that could be the World Cup finals in the cricket match, or it could be even announcing results of a university, which is going to be very event-driven and event-specific. There, you just need to provision more number of resources and get ready for that predictable spike. And finally, we have auto-scaling, which is very unpredictable. You never know when you're going to hit a specific threshold and what's going to impact that. For example, your application or your website getting reviewed um, on, on some of the popular sites, or you get slash dotted, and there is a spike of traffic that hits your site. So you need to get ready for that. So there you are going to have a policy to enable auto-scaling to automatically take care of that. Of course, all this happens by leveraging the technologies behind EC2 and AWS, like CloudWatch metrics and management tools, automation, and so on. Uh, you can scale up pretty easily both your compute and storage, for example, when it comes to uh, compute, you can set up a policy. I'm going to skip this. This is going to define an autoscale policy to react whenever there is a spike in, in the traffic. Assuming that is set properly, you're just going to look at the console, keep refreshing it to notice how your instances get automatically added and reduced. So this ability of growing and shrinking on demand is called elasticity, right? Uh, and the same thing, I'm sorry, uh, I, I just missed, but uh, the same thing is also applicable for 
uh, elastic block store where you can scale up your storage. Uh, now comes in dynamic and static, where how you are going to deal with uh, the data that needs to be processed, crunched, uh, and how you are going to deal with data that is static gets leveraged uh, by your, your end users and consumers. For example, this event is being live streamed, and we have many audience watching this live on the internet, uh, and that's, that's actually the content that you want to keep close to the end user because you don't want to have any lag, any latency there, offer the best possible user experience, but you have data that needs to be processed and computed, which is more dynamic. That should be kept close to your compute, which is EC2. So maybe you might want to run them on the same availability zone for reduced latency rates and better performance. But you should take your data and keep it as close as possible to your end users and your customers, which will offer better user experience. So how do you do this? There are a variety of techniques. For example, you can leverage a concept called bootstrapping an EC2 instance, which will bring up an instance and instructs how to split the static content and dynamic content. Or you can also use an elastic IP, which will give you an ability to route the traffic uh, from one uh, instance to another instance. If that is the endpoint of your EC2 instance, you can introduce what is called as an elastic IP. And this gives you a redirection capability. In case your initial web server has issues and it is not healthy, you can automatically bring up another instance and start routing the traffic to the better, healthier instance. And this is extremely seamless. You can just point your A record or your C name to one of your Elastic IPs, and the traffic automatically gets routed. So let's see how, how you can use Elastic IP to leverage this technique. So we are going to, we already have a web server, so we're going to click Elastic IPs in the navigation bar and request for a new Elastic IP. So this is going to get an Elastic IP, which is a public IP address, allocated to you from a pool of public IP addresses. And now we're going to attach this or associate this to the running web server. And from this point, the traffic gets routed from the Elastic IP, but not the actual public DNS name. So that gives you the redirection capability. Now comes in other very important aspect of architecting for the cloud, which is thinking parallel. Before we really get to the, the architectural aspects, for a while, I want you to think about how Mumbai Dabbawala's function, right? What has Mumbai Dabbawala's got to do with parallelizing and, and distributed computing on the cloud? Well, Mumbai Dabbawala's actually do few things very well. Their primary job is to pick up lunch boxes or tiffin boxes from households and deliver it to offices and do the same thing in the evening, collect the, offices, collect the boxes from offices and bring them back to the households. This might sound very simple, but what goes into it is extremely efficient and optimized to an extent that Mumbai Dabbawala's got Six Sigma certification, and they have uh, an efficiency of 99.9%. Right? So what exactly do they do? Uh, once a Tiffin Dabba is picked up, it gets color-coded, and it gets coded based on how it's going to be delivered to the destination. And this Dabba goes through a different process where uh, a specific Mumbai Dabbawala will pick up the box and delivers it to the next destination, and it goes through a variety of hops to finally reach the destination. The thing is, at any point, no Dabbawala precisely knows where the box actually came from and where it is going. He only does his job as an intermediary, and all of them collaboratively work together to achieve the common goal. But all of them work in parallel across the, across the city, across the metro, to achieve the same goal, right? And to technically look at this process, they do few things in a sequence. They collect, they shuffle, they sort, they reduce, and they deliver. Now, when you put all these keywords together, collect, shuffle, sort, uh, reduce, and deliver, it reminds you of a framework called MapReduce. Now, though it may not be called as MapReduce, they have mastered the same algorithm almost a century ago. And that's exactly what is now called as Hadoop, or it's available on Amazon uh, Web Services as Elastic Map Reduce. So when you're architecting for the cloud, always think of how you can parallelize your operations, how you can leverage a technique where you are employing multiple resources to do the same task. One way of thinking about it is if you require one computer uh, to process a job and it is taking 500 hours, 
how about spinning 500 instances and getting the job done in just one hour? Right? Here you are thinking in parallel and employing more resources to achieve the common goal. Uh, that happens when you are leveraging Elastic Map Reduce or you are chunking your large data that's, that's being uploaded to S3 and, and using a parallel upload process or even leveraging Elastic Load Balancing, which is going to route the traffic to a fleet of web servers. Let's see ELB in action. So I'm going to create an Elastic Load Balancer and point port 80 of my Load Balancer to port 80 of my uh, EC2 instance, give it a des descriptive name, and configure some more options. We'll revisit this in my technical track session, developing fault-tolerant applications. But for now, we are just creating an ELB, adding the number of web servers that we already have to the ELB, and going live. After a while, you will notice that the load balancer gives us a public DNS endpoint, which can be wired to the A record of your IP address. And that's going to be acting as an intermediary to route the traffic in the most optimized way. So we have just parallelized the web server traffic. right? And now comes in another very interesting aspect of not fearing constraints. Many architects have this uh, concern about dealing with virtual infrastructure and dealing with constraints. So what exactly uh, are you going to deal with? Uh, I, I'm not going to touch and feel the resources, so how do, you, how do I really deal with the cloud infrastructure? How do I live with constraints? Well, everyone has constraints, but uh, the, the best of the folks who, who are known to deal with constraints are called superheroes. And when I say superheroes, we only think of the heroes from Bollywood and down south who are known for overcoming constraints in a better way. And that's why they are called superheroes. And I come from down south, and who's a superhero that you can associate with South Indian? Rajnikanth, right? He is best known to defy the laws of physics, laws of gravity, and never worry about constraints. So I want to show you how he does that very efficiently. So be a superhero. Don't worry about constraints. Don't fear constraints. On the cloud, you have a variety of techniques to deal with constraints. You need better database performance. You can either shard the database or enable read replicas or go for clustering. Uh, you want more RAM? You can leverage memcached set up on EC2 or even subscribe to a new service that we launched called Elastic Cache. Or you want better performance for the disk I.O.? Well, you can set up Elastic Block Store in a RAID configuration and increase your disk I.O. and IOPS. So that, that's basically how you deal with uh, the, the constraints on the cloud. To give you one example, this is, this is something that we have already seen, uh, multi-AZ for RDS. But if you want to uh, enhance the performance of your database server, you can deploy your database and enable what is called as a read replica, which gives you a highly optimized way of dealing with the database traffic. You have one master, which is going to be the read-write server, but you can go up to five read replicas, which will be highly optimized for the read and index-based traffic. So this is going to increase the database I.O. performance dramatically when you deploy read replicas. So that's, that was about uh, using some of the techniques to overcome constraints. And now comes security, the most important aspect. Dr. Werner Vogel spent a lot of time, and I just want to reemphasize that our number one priority is security. We are very, very concerned and we are very focused on making the infrastructure secure. That's our number one priority. And we have seen a variety of certifications that are already in place uh, that Dr. Werner has mentioned. But I want to talk to you about one thing, which is EC2 instance isolation. At the lowest level, we isolate the EC2 instances so that even an instance running on the same physical hardware will never be able to talk to another customer instance sharing the same physical hardware. At the lowest possible level, the instance isolation is taken care of. And similarly, we have security groups which offer you a firewall kind of a layer that protect your resources from unauthorized traffic. Uh, for example, if you are deploying an end-tier application on AWS, which almost looks like a fleet of web servers, fleet of app servers, database servers, and some databases running in RDS, you might want to open up selective ports for a different kind of traffic. For example, 
the public traffic, public internet-based traffic, should come via port 80. And you want to open up all IP addresses for that. But the administrator who is sitting in the, in the data center or the corporate environment has a static IP address, and you want to open it up only for port 22. So the public internet traffic will never be able to access SSH, but the administrator has access to port 22. And similarly, I can define policies that will restrict or allow traffic to each of the layers in such a way that I can never short circuit this chain and access the database or the uh, uh, app tier directly. I have to come via the appropriate channel to touch any of the resources. So that is the security group uh, which is going to act as a filter and, and giving you a firewall kind of a layer protecting your resources. So let's take a look at how security groups are created. So now we have the resources in place. So we are going ahead and creating a security group. Let's give it a descriptive name, and then go ahead and define the policies. So once the security group is created, I'm going to define a policy saying uh, HTTP traffic comes from any IP address, all zeros, but SSH traffic comes from a specific IP address that is defined in another security group. Now, this is going to allow or disallow traffic based on the origin. So that's going to be very, very easy for you to deal with. And just uh, revisiting some of the concepts that uh, Dr. Werner has mentioned, you can leverage AWS Direct Connect, which runs a dedicated uh, network connection between your infrastructure and AWS infrastructure, low latency, highly secure way of accessing the cloud resources. Or you can also leverage uh, VPC or virtual private cloud, where you can move your sensitive workloads into a cordon of space within EC2, thus giving you a very secure way of moving your workloads into the cloud. And you can also run dedicated instances where your instance is run in a single tenant mode on a dedicated piece of hardware without sharing the underlying infrastructure. So these are some of the ways of dealing with the networking and security. So it's time for me to quickly summarize. And this slide is going to be uh, available on the AWS architecture site. Uh, and we are also going to post the same video and the slide deck on the AWS Cloud Tour India page. You can also access it on the slide share, which is available today. Uh, and remember, I have a technical session in the technical track about fault tolerance sessions where I'm going to do a deep dive on some of the concepts. So these are my coordinates. Um, I hope you like this session and have a great day ahead. Thank you.